Hi, it's Friday evening, August 2nd. We're still tracking a tropical disturbance that is moving across Cuba right now and will end up in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico in a day or so. This was called Invest 97L yesterday, but today the National Hurricane Center has decided to initiate advisories on the system. It is not yet a tropical depression, but it is expected to become one over the next 24 hours and impact land. So the National Hurricane Center has initiated advisories a little bit early, and so this is now called Potential Tropical Cyclone 4, or PTC4. Now, as we look at the satellite loop out there today, we are seeing still gradual organization. This was a tropical open wave yesterday. It likely remains essentially a wave axis today, but we might be starting to see the slight closing off of a elliptically shaped area of weak circulation straddling Cuba on both sides, some to the north and some to the south. And the mid-level center is probably a little bit farther south than the surface circulation, which is a little bit offset maybe towards the northeast. If we look at a more zoomed in view here, we'll start to piece together how the flow around the system is going. There's southerlies coming across eastern Cuba. You can see more here over the Bahamas, and then you start to see over the northern coastline of Cuba more easterly. So the wave axis at the surface is likely somewhere in here. And then near the Cayman Islands, you do see some northerlies on this backside and even some weak westerlies beginning to develop flowing into this area of deep thunderstorm activity near and south of the Cayman Islands. And in the mid-levels, what you might see as rotation to your eye visually is mostly the mid-level rotation, which is focused primarily along and south of the Cuban coastline. This has been interesting over the last 24 to 48 hours as models have been all slightly wrong on this system in small different ways. And that can matter for the forecast later, but the summary is that the GFS has been a little bit too active on the northern part of the system north of Cuba. The European model was a little more correct that it would concentrate its mid-level rotation down near and south of Cuba, but the Euro was also too weak with it, whereas the GFS got the strength more correct. As it stands today, the system is rather strong and robust in the mid-levels, and we are starting to see rotation there. You can also see that on the Cayman Islands radar, which is only showing the western half of the system right now, but you'll see the northerlies coming down. There's Grand Cayman right there, and then maybe a little bit of a pull into the convection here, and so you can kind of make out the rotation that is likely going on near and south of central Cuba right now. Now, all of this will end up mattering in the Gulf of Mexico because we're talking about kind of two things here. One is, will the system develop into a legitimate tropical storm that can bring hazards that we expect, like wind, storm surge, heavy rain? And the other is, where will it go? This affects both. Now on the Euro, we mentioned that the Euro has had the storm a little bit too weak and it has been more diffuse than in reality that turns into a weaker system later. So as we go to Sunday morning, this is Florida right here, and the system is barely a circulation, rather weak here, pressure of 1,008 millibars, and very asymmetric with uh, most of the moisture entirely east of the center. This is much weaker than the GFS, which has a more tropical storm-like structure going on here with a more symmetric moisture signature, more closed isobars, stronger circulation, and likely a tropical storm here probably on the weekend, uh, but still uh, stronger than the Euro. And this is because of the different biases that these two models have. Now right now, this is looking more like a GFS kind of outcome. This is likely to form once it gets north of Cuba. And speaking of the track there, uh, this is you know straddling Cuba, but it's moving along the spine, and then eventually it's going to emerge here near or south of the western Florida Keys and kind of in the Florida Strait, southeastern Gulf of Mexico there. And that's when we're likely to see it start closing off into a tropical-like circulation that becomes a little more compact, uh, tighter in size, and more like a tropical storm, at which point uh, the National Hurricane Center may classify it as such. And it'll be interesting to see the details of the short-term track. Right now, the GFS and the official forecast gets pretty close to Key West here. Uh, assuming that this northern side is going to help yank all of the mid-level circulation kind of up towards the Keys. Uh, but if this part down here south of Cuba ends up a little bit more dominant, then we could see a track more like this, a little bit west of Key West. And there is still room for some shifting around there, so be aware of that over the next couple of days. The forecast can and likely will get adjusted over the next couple of days. 
As we look at the environmental conditions, this is the water vapor satellite loop showing that there is now some expanding upper level outflow, the feathery, feathery cirrus moving northward, eastward, and south of the system. So low wind shear here, it is pushing the upper level trough that was over here kind of out of the way. And the conditions in general are favorable right now with the exception of the big island of Cuba right in the middle of the storm just cutting through it. That is of course disrupting development and adding some wrinkles that is difficult for computer models to handle, hence some of the uncertainty that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. Now as the storm gets up into the Gulf of Mexico, conditions will remain favorable for a while. This is the GFS depiction of the upper level wind on Sunday evening. This is where the storm is on the model just beginning to develop and we see some southwesterlies aloft. On its northern side there's in general an upper level ridge over the northern Bahamas right here and eventually there will be a little bit of shear. The storm's going to move north along the western Florida coastline on the model. It ends up just west of Tampa on Sunday morning and you can see there's a little bit of a, a lane of southwesterly flow aloft. It's not particularly strong but because it's on the western edge of this ridge as opposed to more directly underneath it, there could be some shear here. And for that reason, you see as the storm is moving onto the Florida Peninsula, there is a little bit of dryness on the western side that could be getting pushed in by just a little bit of southwesterly or westerly shear. And it's even more acute as we saw on the European model, which you know you have dry half and then the wet half on the eastern side. So this could present some challenges to the intensification of any storm that does develop here. Uh, but it's unlikely to prevent development entirely and in general conditions would favor a strengthening tropical storm in the eastern gulf if the system is indeed over water. Now let's talk a little bit more about the track here. This is the European Ensemble Mean 500 millibar height and vorticity, the vorticity in coloring for early Sunday morning. This strip of yellow is where the storm could be and you can see that there's kind of an elongated wave axis structure here showing you really the range of possible locations depending on whether the northern or southern side of the system tightens up the most. The storm could be, as we talked about, moving over Key West and ending up here, or it could be a little bit more towards the west and more down here on entering the Gulf of Mexico. And the primary steering influence is this trough over the Appalachians, and this is going to be pulling out to the northeast, but before it does that, it's going to open up a lane of flow toward the north. That's why uh, PTC-4 is moving northward in the Gulf of Mexico. We have a ridge east of the Bahamas like this, so that's helping to usher the storm towards the north, but then this trough, it's going to exit, and so you'll see over the next couple of days how it pulls out rather quickly, uh, rushing off, and now the storm is potentially over northern Florida, or the northeastern Gulf of Mexico on the model. And what happens here is the ridge over the Great Plains starts to nose in gradually further and further towards the east, trying to block the path of the system. And this, this ridge uh, east or northeast of the Bahamas is still here. So the storm could potentially get kind of mired between two different ridges where the steering flow is rather weak in between them. So on most modeling, just like yesterday, we still have a bit of a slowdown going into Monday, Tuesday, and beyond into early next week. And on the model, there's a range of possible locations where the storm could be, but they all show a slowing of the storm. Now, the magnitude of this slowing and what happens to the ultimate track is going to be very dependent on how the development process goes in the southeastern Gulf. You know, back at the beginning, we talked about will it be close to Key West or will it be a little farther to the west? That will actually matter a whole lot because while the trough over the Appalachians is digging in here, if the storm happens to approach southwest Florida quicker because it moved up near the Keys and then immediately approached the coast, it will get farther north faster, be able to take advantage of this racetrack of flow around the ridge in the Bahamas, and perhaps get northeast fast enough to just continue moving northeast and not really stop as it moves near the southeastern U.S. coastline and eventually gets out over the northwestern Atlantic. If the system is a little bit farther west and south to enter the Gulf though, this trough might have a chance to pull out before the system has fully escaped and made it across Florida, in which case you could see more of a slowdown and meandering motion near northern Florida, Georgia, or you know, in general not getting northeast as quickly. 
You'll see some of this on the explicit forecast from the ensemble here, which is going to show you 51 different possible versions of the future, the 51 ensemble members. And on the Euro, you can see where it has the storm on Sunday. And then what happens is some of the members are faster and cross Florida right away. You see them off the Carolinas. Others move into the Florida panhandle and they are slower to get north. And for that reason, the trough escapes uh, before it's able to pick up the storm. And so it gets a little stuck. And so some of these members remain over the Florida panhandle or near the Gulf Coast. And then others are still uh, meandering off the southeastern U.S. coast. And in general, you can see a wide range of possible outcomes here based on that sensitivity. On the GFS, in general, the model is a little bit farther to the east and faster than the Euro. So you get more of these moving into Florida right away, farther south, closer to, say, Tampa, the central Florida peninsula. So most of these actually end up crossing Florida and getting near the southeastern U.S. coast, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. You don't see as many stuck in the northern Gulf of Mexico or near the Florida panhandle. So the model's still kind of disagreeing on this here. But in general, you see when the the GFS ensemble members continue forward. Some are faster and they escape quicker near the outer banks of North Carolina. Others are left behind for a longer period of time. So even still within this model, there is uncertainty near the southeastern U.S. coast. Not to mention, will it be over land or water will matter a whole lot in terms of impacts. If it just slowly moves inland, we're mostly talking about rain. If it moves over water more slowly, then it could redevelop into something stronger that also brings storm surge, surf, and wind hazards along with it. So there's still some questions to be answered about this system. Many of them will hopefully be answered once it's in this part of the Gulf right here. That's probably when we will learn a whole lot about this part of the lake if it's going to move up uh, to the northeast like this. The National Hurricane Center advisory for potential tropical cyclone 4 is more GFS-like than Euro-like based on what I just showed you. So it shows a track fairly close between Key West and the Dry Tortugas and then up towards the central Florida coastline into the Nature Coast and then across and along the southeastern U.S. coastline kind of straddling the coastline there. Again, difficult forecast based on whether it's over land or water. You do see it slow down a bit here. So these are 12 hourly spaced points. And then you see they compress a little bit. And then these two points are actually 24 hours apart. So if you just mentally add one there, you can see that the dots are kind of getting closer together. And so there is a slowing shown by the forecast, but it doesn't outright stall. If the system were to track a little bit farther to the west like this, it increases the odds of an additional slowdown. So we'll keep an eye out for that if there are any changes in the forecast over the next couple of days. And given that the system is still interacting with land and has not yet formed, there are potential for adjustments to this forecast. So keep an eye out at hurricanes.gov for the latest updates from the National Hurricane Center. Right now, there are tropical storm watches for the Keys, tropical storm warning for a portion of southwestern Florida, and a watch heading up toward the Nature Coast and the Tampa Bay area. No watches yet for anyone along the southeastern coast, but those will come within a day or two as the system progresses along this expected track. Now, right now, given everything we've discussed, there's limited time over water here over the eastern Gulf with which to intensify. So right now, the expectation is not for a hurricane in the eastern Gulf near Florida, but a strengthening tropical storm is likely. So we could still have winds in excess of 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. So those could cause high surf. Coastal flooding is possible. Some wind issues with trees and power outages, that sort of thing. And then rain is the big story here, as especially if the storm is slowing down, there is an elevated risk of flash flooding, not only in Florida, but up into the southeastern U.S. states as well. We will see if the storm slows a little more than this forecast shows, whether this risk goes up. One of the good news stories about this storm is that there is some dry air over the, over the Gulf of Mexico. So if that is able to get sucked in by any of this wind shear out of the west, it's likely that the western side and northern side may not see so much rain. Most of the rain will be concentrated east of the center. So Florida, you're likely getting rain no matter what. But when it comes to places farther up the coastline, the track may matter a lot. As if the storm is even just a little bit offshore, you can see that there might not be that much moisture in rain, say, over inland South Carolina if the storm is actually offshore like this. But these are details that, again, are now uh, still in flux given that the storm has not yet formed. 
and the track is still difficult to pin down with precision. So keep a close eye on this if you're in the southeastern U.S. and just have a plan ready to go just in case, whether it's for flooding or wind impacts. Be ready in case the system comes your way. That'll be about it for this video. I'll have another one tomorrow. Thanks for watching.